not so bad. Ah, okay. <laughs> Could you give me a small sign that you go to start? Because we are going to record everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think Roger will start actually, I'm sure someone will introduce this, and Roger will start talking about uh, two blades, and then I'll talk about the wheat program. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay, it looks like nothing too strange is happening to the slides. So if everybody's paying attention, you get the whole thing right now. Escape. Put her back at the beginning. Escape. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have Lynn Räuber and Roger Friedman from Two Blades here. And uh, we have met Roger and Ravi and myself, we have met I think four years ago, five years yes, ago, yeah. more or less in, in Minnesota. And there the I, idea was discussed, they, they talked to us uh, whether we would be interested to uh, work on realizing the dream of our wheat breeders, in particular of our rust resistance breeders, to work on a approach where we can combine various genes as a cassette, so there would be no recombination. And this is what we have talked for the last 30 years. But uh, everybody understood the concept, but nobody could do it because we didn't have the technology. And the two blades in the last years, there have been tremendous progress made on, as you will hear during the seminar, on gene cloning, what has taken in the past years. If the right information, mutants are available, that can be done now extremely fast. And so that's offered now completely new opportunities to combine genes. And that would be another option to develop durable resistance in particular, if combined with semitromblasm, which is based at adult plant resistance. And uh, Lynn and Roger are here to discuss with, up, with us, with Simit, how we can proceed and how we can move on in this area, because maybe the, the technology is now ready to prove and go beyond the proof of concept. And uh, they will give now a presentation on what two blades is, and also on some of the scientific approaches and then afterwards, uh, at least the rust gurus, but also the geneticists are invited to go up to the wheat program meeting room where we then have another two hours discussion because we really need to, to be very clear on what genes are we going to use, what, what we are going to use, and that will be done then also during the next two hours. And so if you are experts in the areas of genetics or in the area of rust, uh, you will be most welcome, and uh, the Rust guys, they know they have to come anyhow. Right. <laughs> With this one, I turn over to Rapture, and I apologize myself. I have another meeting, but I will be there when the brainstorm makes a lot of waves. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to talk very briefly uh, to explain what the Two Blades Foundation is. 
so that uh, you know what kind of context to put this in, and then Lynn is going to talk about our wheat program. Um, so uh, Two Blades is a, uh, a 501c3 foundation. That's uh, an American tax category, and what it means is that we're a tax-exempt, not-for-profit organization. And we have no shares, we have no shareholders, we don't make any profits, we do make money. When we make money, it goes back into supporting uh, our programs. Uh, nobody uh, is going to um, get any other kind of benefit except seeing uh, the programs go forward. And uh, our mission uh, is not really a research mission, it's a development mission. Uh, what we are focused on is addressing unmet needs uh, in uh, plant disease control. And what we attempt to do is to find uh, solutions uh, that will allow us to control the major diseases of major crops and deliver these control uh, means to actual practical agriculture. And um, I think it might be worth just telling you briefly how it was that we started doing this, which really was sort of the turn of the century. Uh, and certainly we existed from 2003, but the idea was swirling around a little bit before then. Uh, at that time, uh, extraordinary progress had been made in the fundamental understanding of plant disease processes and disease resistance in research programs around the world. Um, but the striking thing was that none of this was actually turning into products. There were two disease-resistant engineered products. There was a papaya, which is virus-resistant, I'm sure that you all know about these. And there are also some squash, which had been uh, developed as virus-resistant lines. And they had kind of flown under the radar. And they've been under the radar ever since. You can still buy the seeds of these GMOs. And nobody's talking about it. Uh, but there was nothing else to uh, match against this extraordinary wealth of research. And in fact, here we are, uh, 15 years later, and there still is nothing else. But we looked at this situation, and we thought it was very disappointing. Um, I happened to be a, a non-executive director of a technology licensing company in Norwich, which dealt with John Innes and the Sainsbury Laboratory. And I knew that there were any number of patents which appeared to be valuable and full of potential, available for licensing. And none of the uh, companies which had the capacity to develop these patent uh, findings into products had any interest in doing it. Uh, and the real issue here is that the way that the academic research world works, uh, the job is finished at a certain point. A patent is filed. It may not be the best patent you could get for a basic discovery, but it's the best that they can do if they work with Arabidopsis, let's say, not a major crop. And then at the other end uh, of the spectrum, there are the uh, breeding companies, the agrobiotech companies, which have the capacity to do uh, work with GMOs. And they look at these kinds of findings and more or less shrug their shoulders. And in point of fact, at that time, for various reasons, very understandable and not, not silly reasons, uh, the major companies were really focusing on abiotic stress and had no interest in disease. So uh, we felt that uh, there was a, an important job to be done, which was to bridge between these two worlds and to develop uh, fundamental research findings to the point where they could actually be taken on board 
by the seed companies and turned into useful products. And that's basically what we do and what we've done. Uh, and uh, we do this in a, a whole range of different ways. We, uh, the main one is that we fund research programs which are very carefully selected around the world. And these are selected in part because they are components of a plan for the development of a product. And we manage that uh, product development. We deal with all the commercial issues. of the best uh, laboratories for uh, basic work on plant disease in the world. Some would say the best. Uh, I wouldn't wish to make that claim. Um, and uh, we put all these things together to take uh, discoveries and take them to the point where they can become potentially useful agricultural products. And um, I'm just going to mention, if you can shove up that slide, uh, a couple of our programs to give you a sense of what they're, what they're about. So bacterial spot is a Xanthomonas infection, um, which uh, hits tomatoes um, in hot, wet production areas. So the US southeast Florida which is a major tomato production area. And as you can see, you can get losses one year in three or four can be as high as that, but certainly 25% would be nothing out of the ordinary. And this has been the number one problem for tomato production, fresh market tomato production in Florida for the last 35 years or more. Uh, every attempt to control it has failed. Uh, there are crop protection chemicals whose main effect is to pollute the environment in a really serious way. Uh, and there isn't anything that works. We have developed a transgenic approach to the control of this uh, disease. We, in this case, because we couldn't find uh, a, a corresponding company which had the guts to say, yes, we'll take it on, because they're all afraid uh, that if it's transgenic, there will be problems about selling it. So we actually had to do everything, including the trialing, uh, the uh, production of finished varieties, the procurance of procuring the appropriate germplasm, and so on. And we have now got uh, several years of trials with uh, finished varieties, a number of different finished F1 hybrid Florida appropriate varieties, which remarkably not only uh, are not um, are trashed by the disease, but produce, and the number I'm going to give you is for real, um, a, a, an increase in yield uh, which is doubled uh, for this crop. And uh, the major tomato growers are now looking at this uh, like a dog with a chop uh, tied to its tail, they really don't know what to do. Because on the one hand, it's everything they want, and on the other hand, they're afraid they can't sell it. Uh, so that's one program which is far along. Um, the second one is an example of our working with a company. Uh, it's a program on Asian soybean rust. Uh, the uh, production of Asian soybean rust in Brazil, and it's all transgenic there, so there's no issue about making it transgenic, because it already is, uh, produces, uh, it costs up to $4 billion a year in fungicide costs and lost yield. And we have a program which is running in our uh, lab at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich on cloning resistance genes from uh, heterologous uh, material. And uh, our partner 
is transforming these into uh, the soybeans, and we look forward to seeing a product in due course, I hope. Um, and we have a, a number of other programs, and the most significant one, actually, of all of our programs uh, is the STEM Rust program, which we started in 2008 uh, with work on effectors, and I'm not going to say anything more about that um, because uh, it'll be described uh, by Lynn. And, and there are yet other prospects. And we have a particular uh, focus on the disease problems in less developed agriculture simply because the possibility of dispensing with agrochemicals uh, even supposing people can afford them, uh, is very significant there economically and in other respects. And uh, the need is great, and the commercial companies have got no interest. So that's uh, a, a, an area where uh, we expect to have an expanding interest. But uh, stem rust is what we're here to discuss today. Uh, and I think finally, oh yes, so that that's, uh, tells you where these different programs are. Some of them are very early on. Some of them are partnered. This one is, soybean rust is partnered, but not yet field validated. Bacteria spot is validated, but not partnered. Uh, and finally, the group of people who actually um, are involved in doing this, uh, here they are, um, two of them with you. That's. 50% of the whole operation. Peter Van Esser runs the group in the Sainsbury Laboratory, and there are some of the people in it. And Diane Horvat um, is our president and is based in Evanston, couldn't be here today. Okay, so over to Lynn. Thank you. Are there any questions, I should say, that I can answer? No? Good. Right. Do you need this? Oh, good. It's got a clip. Let's see if I can s slip this on here real quick. Don't make this easy on people without pockets. All right. I'm here to talk about our STEM Rust program, which I'm assured that you're interested in. As uh, Roger mentioned, we started in about 2008. And even at that time, our goal was to create a stacked resistance gene cassette targeted against the UG99 race group, They're basically taking a number of different resistance genes and combining them into one locus. So our premise at the time is that the best resistance package would combine the sort of partial resistance genes, or APRs, with major dominant R genes. And uh, so basically we set out in a fairly logical progression to identify and isolate these multiple R genes. Just took us a while. Um, deploy at least three, although I'm voting for five, in combination as a single transgenic locus, and supply this transgenic event to wheat breeding programs such as this one. You might recognize this guy. I think I'm, this is rumored to be Obergon in 2008. So I'll tell you in, in succession about the approaches we started out with. Um, one, of the, one of the first things we started was to, to try to develop Egelop sharonensis or Sharon goat grass as a genetic system for isolating our genes, since I'm sure this group is well aware that wild relatives are very rich sources of resistance genes. And uh, the work of Pablo Oliveira at the time showed that Sharon goat grass was indeed an excellent uh, source of the resistances to um, all these major uh, diseases of interest in weed, including, of course, uh, stem rust. However, there, is, there, there are some challenges to using Sharon goat grass. It's not the Arabidopsis of the wheat world or even the Brachypodium of the wheat world. It's a bit tedious. So the generation time is seven and a half months at maximum speed. The seed has, has to be uh, peeled, and I've heard at length from people who've had to do this, how a pain it is. 
Um, the anthers uh, hang out nicely and allow it to outcross profusely, so that basically you have to bag the uh, spikes in the greenhouse to prevent uh, outcrossing. The plants tiller copiously, and, uh, and I believe they're not, um, what's the word, synchronous, so they, they produce heads at different times. They tiller, they've got to be staked, they've got to be handled continuously. Real pain in the neck. And also, the genome is very large and has many areas of uh, rather low recombination. So as a genetic system, about all it really had going for it was the fact that it was diploid. Um, but yet the group uh, progressed on, and we are pursuing a couple of different uh, resistance genes from Sharon goat grass. But at the same time, uh, they were looking around and saying, is there a faster way to get at these resistance genes? And um, at that time, the uh, group was uh, located at the Sainsbury Laboratory in uh, Norwich, England, which is a really rich source of the newest and hottest technology. And Jonathan Jones is on our scientific advisory board and had, and, you know, had been thinking on our behalf about uh, this problem of isolating resistance genes uh, rapidly and also on his own behalf and, you know, and, you know, because this is of interest in almost every species. And what they found is that the major class of resistance genes called uh, nibblers or nucleotide binding leucine rich repeat genes have a great deal of homology. So there's a, there's a large complement of these in, in each species. There's 700 in um, t potato, and I should have armed myself with the number in wheat, but I have to admit I don't know, but it's probably more than 700. And, but yet they, they have conserved regions which you can pull out using RNA baits. So you can design having a sequence of a bunch of resistance genes from one, from one species. You can design a bait array that will allow you to pull out all of the nibblers in that species. So uh, Jonathan Jones's used, group used this in potato. They tried this out and they, they found they increased the known nibbler complement by over 50 percent from something like 400 to 700 genes. They found they could really indeed isolate and annotate many more genes. Uh, one of the problems, you can sequence a lot of genomes, but these, these genes tend to be in long repetitive arrays, and so they're very hard to assemble. And uh, this technique allows you to pull them out one at a time and put them together. So, they found they could do this, and they found that they could use a bulk segregate analysis and a bulk susceptible and resistant lines and actually um, come up with uh, markers uh, near their resistance gene of interest. So this was pretty exciting. And then Branda Wolf uh, started to think, well, what if we could basically use this uh, technique in combination with EMS mutagenesis, take a resistant wheat line, mutagenize it, screen the M2 for susceptibility to a particular rust isolate with a particular A virulence gene, and then go out, then do RENSEQ, which is we're calling resistance gene enrichment sequencing on the mutants and the wild type. And uh, Burkhard Starnagel in his lab was um, the uh, bioinformatic wizard who managed to assemble all these little bits of resistance genes from the wild type and the mutants the de novo assembly, and annotate the contigs, and, sh and compare, and show that you could isolate, um, you could identify genes that were mutated in all of your mutants in the, of your line of interest and not in your wild type. Actually, they, they, they didn't show this at first. They met with a lot of skepticism at first. So I said, well, let's go out there and take a gene that's already been cloned and see if we can redo it. So they collaborated with um, Sam Periannon and Evans Laguda in, from CSIRO, who had just isolated the SR33 gene, and they had had, had uh, six mut mutants that helped them define it, uh, four EMS mutants and two deletion mutants. So they ran this trick. They designed their bait library with all the nibblers they could uh, come up with from wheat, enriched sequence, assembled, compared and found that indeed they could find um, all the mutations in contigs uh, corresponding to SR33. You need a certain number of uh, mutants, because at least four, probably six is better, because you will find times by coincidence where you have 
two mutations perhaps in the same gene. We just rather tolerant of mutagenesis. But if you have six mutations in the same gene, you're pretty sure you got it. So this was all nice, and they said, well, well, now we've done our proof of concept. What else can we do with this? So again, they collaborated with Evans and Sam, who were working on cloning the SR22 gene, which had been integrated from Triticum monococcum. It's a very useful broad-spectrum resistance gene that is, um, that is um, useful against UG99. However, they weren't having any luck cloning it because there was suppressed recombination around their region of integration, and they just couldn't get any markers to get any closer. So um, they sent DNA from six mutants, and lo and behold, uh, the bioinformatic analysis showed that five mutations were found in one contig, and then by uh, doing some more informatic analysis, they were able to join this with another contig that contained the final mutation, and they were able to sew together this whole, the whole gene by, um, by race and, find, and pull out the promoter sequence, et cetera, et cetera. So they got a functional um, SR22 gene, and very hot off the press, they've now shown that they've transformed it and they can get resistance. So didn't show you that slide, but it's a secret. But, uh, and this has been uh, submitted for uh, publication. So can they do it again? So uh, Sam and Evans also were working on cloning the SR45 gene ingressed from Ejelops tauchii. Um, another useful gene against UG99, although uh, virulence has been reported in Canada. Another six EMS mutants. And um, this time their sequencing is getting better and better as they're using longer uh, range sequencing technologies. They're using now PacBio sequencing and therefore they're getting larger assemblies as they go along. So this time they managed to pull out one contig that had all their mutations and the entire coding sequence of SR22. I'm just missing a little tad of the three prime UTR. And um, this one also has been transformed and really hot off the press it is working. So we're pretty sure we've got the right thing. So this is really exciting, and uh, what Brandis Group has been doing is turning this into a pipeline. And he's obtained material from a number of different collaborators and uh, is going after all the genes on this slide. SR22 and 45 we've already gotten, and, um, and all another dozen or so that he's uh, producing mutants or obtaining mutants, uh, doing the sequencing and uh, turning the crank and uh, genes from all these different, um, different accessories. These, the, these are all intergressed into wheat, except for SR1644, which they're trying the Rensec in, um, in Sharonensis. It turns out it's a lot easier to do Rensec in wheat, actually, than in Sharonensis, but uh, they're plodding along on that one. So uh, I should just mention that all this work is going on with a really international network of collaborators, a number of collaborators that are, have uh, provided material. Uh, Branda Wolf and his group that are working on the cloning. Um, the, the mutagenesis and generation of M2 lines is, is, is going on there, but the phenotyping of these with UG99 is going in, in Brian Stephenson's group at the University of Minnesota, because in the dead of winter in Minnesota, they can, they can work with the uh, strains that are needed. Uh, Nick Aliff in Syro and his group are working on transformation for us. So, um, and obviously, we're not the only folks that are interested in cloning resistance genes, and there are other exciting techniques out there of, of exome capture and other techniques being developed that I think are making, really speeding this up. So this is all the known uh, SR targets that we, we know people are going after and trying to clone. The ones in red are cloned and published. The, the orange ones are the ones I just told you about. Um, you know, and many other of these we know that people have or are very close to. And within a couple of years, I think this whole bucket of 36 genes, the vast majority of them are going to be available for use in a stacking approach. So when we think about creating a stack, 
um, what's the ideal, the ideal set of genes. And um, what I think is that we'll, we'll need to keep identifying new resistance genes and sources of resistance. And my preferred sources of resistance are those that haven't been integrated into wheat. We've been taking advantage of the work of we're probably talking about scientists' decades of work to produce all these, all these integrations and all this genetic material. Um, but um, part of the problem is, is those genes can be deployed by breeding, perhaps singly, rather than in a cassette where you have a number of genes protecting one another and may have a higher chance of being broken. So uh, one of the things we're thinking about for the future is other sources of genes that haven't been deployed in wheat, like Egelops uh, species, rye, except for the one intergression, you know, those can't be brought in, and brachypodium. And we're working on these different sorts of approaches with different collaborators in, uh, for stem rust and stripe rust genes. So one approach that Brand's lab is trying out is, is looking for um, SR lo lo and loci and sharonensis um, by GWAS. So this uh, bottom part of this slide here is showing a study they did mapping genes in a single cross uh, in sharonensis from which uh, 96 recombinant inbred lines had been generated at great uh, time and pain. And um, this uh, this here on uh, chromosome one is one of the uh, genes that they've been going after. Um, so one of the things they have available is a collection of 130 diverse successions of sharonensis. And um, they, they, uh, gene they phenotyped all of these for rust resistance. And they found that uh, they, they can indeed see in this GWAS study the same the, the same uh, peak, probably corresponding to the same locus that you found in this single cross, along with several others that could be pursued. So this is one, one uh, approach we're thinking may be productive in the future. So on a different tack, another thing that was started way back in 2008 was looking at rust effectors. And the reason that, well, there were a couple of reasons that we started this. One is that we knew it would be crucial to understand the genetic diversity of the pathogen and uh, what, uh, what effectors you know, were most conserved and perhaps would make the best targets. But also because I, isolating these effectors you know, produce tools for breeding and, and molecular analysis of the stacks. And I'll get back to that in a minute. So, so having a characterized effector allows you to look for responses in different germplasms, et cetera, et cetera. So for all these reasons, an understanding of the effector biology is key. And um, this also is a lot harder work than everybody you know, thought at first because the rust genome is very uh, large and very, uh, very diverse. Um, however, um, the, however, we're working with uh, Peter Dodd's lab. They've, they've made a lot of progress in using bioinformatics strategies for prediction of candidate effectors. Uh, for, instance, for instance, looking at genes that are conserved and pathogen-associated, induced in plants, and subject to diversifying selection, and uh, finding a number of, can of effector candidates that can be tested in a transient assay. Another way to go after key effectors that are key for a particular gene is to take a rust strain that has an avirulence gene somehow that corresponds to a resistance gene that you're interested in and mutagenizing the rust strain and selecting for virulence on that resistance gene. And then you can sequence the wild type and the mutant uh, rust strains and hopefully pull out AVRX. And this is a strategy we're also working on with Peter Dodd's group and Brian Stephenson's group at the University of Minnesota. So why are we so set on um, using the, yeah, on isolating the effectors? Well, one reason is, suppose we get my uh, desired uh, five R gene stack, all these genes uh, providing resistance to UG99. How do we know they're all working? 
we don't necessarily have testers, tester rust strains that only have one of these avirulence uh, genes and not the others. Neither do we want to generate them in particular because that's just generating super rust. <laughs> uh, so, what, so the idea is using this, uh, this uh, what they call the effector detector vector, first developed in Jonathan Jones's lab, and it's been, um, it's been fine-tuned in uh, Peter Dodd's lab to uh, work well in wheat with rust. So basically, you can deliver a fungal effector uh, fused to a bacterial delivery se uh, sequence from the non-pathogenic uh, Pseudomonas fluorescens and uh, get, uh, re get a hypersensitive response. So if we have AVR 1 through 5, uh, we can uh, test each one individually and show that all the genes in our stack are still working. And this is actually quite important because there's data out there showing that some resistance genes expressed together can interfere with one another. Um, you need to know that uh, you need to know you're getting you know adequate expression on the gene and protein level as well. So we really need to understand if we're stacking resistance genes that we that they're, every single one of them is working, and therefore we want to have every single AVR gene corresponding to any resistance gene we would think about deploying. So finally. How are we going to stack all these genes? It's, it sounds great to say we're going to just put them all in, but um, in general, the size of an insert that you can introduce by agrobacterium transformation is limited, and it's, it's smaller than five resistance genes with their promoters and, uh, and UTRs. So one of the approaches we're looking at is a co-transformation approach and testing this with uh, Michaela because he's shown that often you can co-transform two different, um, two different uh, vectors and get them inserted at the same insertion point. But I think the real, uh, the real way that we want to do this in the long term is with a landing pad. So basically, what you want to be able to do is set up a target lo locus, which could be a pre-inserted landing pad or perhaps a natural sequence found, uh, found in wheat if you have a good target site. One of the things that's been mentioned is the rye integration as a, as a potentially good target site. And then be able to introduce your transgene targeted to this locus using, um, using a, a, a nuclease of, of one sort or another and be able to get insertion and obviously to get a multiple stack, what you'd really like is to be able to do this iteratively, so to continue to put new genes into the same locus. And this would allow us to not only, to not only get a very large insertion in theory, but be able to uh, re-engineer it at will and uh, be able to introduce new, uh, new resistances as old ones become uh, less, less valuable. So I think I've uh, left plenty of time for questions. Um, so I'm, I need to acknowledge uh, Branda's group, and uh, particularly, as I mentioned, Brian Stephenson and Peter Dodds, Evelyn Zabuda, Michaela, <coughs> Jeff Ellis, and a number of other people at CSIRO, Eitan Miller at Tel Aviv University, Harbins and Ermil at the University of Sydney, and a large number of people all over the place who have been providing us germplasm, collaboration is at the Sainsbury Laboratory who've been really uh, key in helping with technology development and so forth. So thank you very much for your attention. And can I answer any questions? Yes. I think that if you could get it, complete resistance is the best strategy because every replication allows mutation. So, I, so the ideal genes would be the tightest genes, 
Ideally, you'd like something tighter than SR22 and SR45, for instance, because they do allow some replication. You probably aren't going to get all ideal genes. But um, that's where I go. And that's another reason for having them in a background with some APR genes. Again, as much as you can suppress replication. We don't care if stem rust survives. Right, so this part of the project we're just getting uh, ramped up. It's one thing that Mikhailov at CSIRO is going to be trying various strategies. Also a postdoc in Branda's lab is, is doing a proof of concept in barley, that one using a uh, CRISPR-mediated strategy. There's some CRE-LOX-mediated strategies that um, are out there that may well be publicly available. So we're just, you know, starting the evaluation of the, of the uh, best way to do this. Uh, one of the things, says you, as you mentioned, uh, Two Blades Foundation mm -hmm. does control the right to use the uh, TAL effectors. So they may not be as speedy as the CRISPRs, <coughs> but uh, they, they, we have complete freedom to operate, which is nice. Yeah, just to reiterate, our philosophy is that we do provide technology at no cost to uh, uh, developing countries and organizations serving their needs. And we do collect royalties you know, in, from companies, as Roger said, to reinvest. But I, I think that technology would go to Simit, would be Simit's. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Simplot, and that cassette is entirely cisgenic, correct? The Simplot cassette? I think they are calling it that, but uh, that's, <laughs> I could be wrong. But, but yes, and, and so uh, we, we're ex it's going to be very interesting to follow that in the United States with Simplot taking it on and see if they can now get it accepted. Further questions? You could probably stump me if you try really hard. Yes? 
I think we're certainly open to work on maize. We have been discussing a potential project around maize lethal necrosis, which I know is also an interest of Simmons. I think we look for opportunities where we can make a difference uh, with a disease resistance technology in the crop. But we, as Roger showed you, we're a small organization, so we have to focus fairly carefully. I think, um, well, I, I think some of the technologies that we have now for isolating resistance genes would be very uh, uh, applicable to collaborators who had the appropriate germplasm and mutants. And uh, we could probably help set up collaborations around those. Um, those, certainly we've concentrated on the rust because, you know, we can't do everything and, and stem rust seemed like the biggest problem. Stripe rust, I think, is our a secondary interest and we have set up collaborations with various folks with germplasm um, and mutants around stripe rust. So we hope to have a few stripe rust resistance genes to work on too. But, um, I, you know, the diseases are uh, myriad. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Hope to see some of you in the discussion.